following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Hello and you are watching Gen XYZ and this is a program as you all know we talk about youth related issues or topics. Now when we take Sri Lanka we are an island and we have a population of uh, a little bit over 22 million and also there are so many other biological species as well. But according to research now most of those species are moving towards an endemic also. Now reasons for this can be due to because of the lack of environmental conservation as well. Now when you talk about conservation also, there are different types of conservation. There's water and energy conservation, there's wildlife conservation, land and soil conservation. So today on the show we are going to talk about environment conservation in general. So now to talk about this topic, we have two experts in this field as well. Now, to introduce you, we have Mudita Katuavala, who is the founder of uh, Pearl Protectors. And also we have Vinod Malvatta, uh, who is the executive director of Lanka Environment Fund and the co-founder of Parrotfish Collective. Uh, thank you both of you all for joining yeah, me on the show today us. and to have this discussion. Mudita, you are not new on the show. You've been on Gen XYZ prior as well with Dani Do I feel. And it's nice to have you again. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure. Have you all been doing okay? Have you all been doing okay? Yes, very well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, to uh, start with our discussion, I want to know um, where does Sri Lanka stand at the moment in environmental conservation compared to foreign nations? Uh, environment, especially on the marine environment, I would say Sri Lanka is not so good. Uh, there could be multiple attributes towards this. Uh, recently, I mean, we went through the economic crisis. We, we also um, had the COVID. And because of this, uh, we've seen our marine environment, especially, uh, I could say the environment in general, uh, being neglected in many ways. And so uh, we, are, we are getting reports of uh, various issues, challenges our ocean is facing compared to maybe five years ago, it's much more higher. Uh, comparatively, comparing with the world, I mean, right now we entered the ocean decade. The UN declared the ocean decade. And also we have so many uh, initiatives globally towards conserving the ocean. But Sri Lanka is yet to really um, harness these benefits and also uh, really take our conservation, maybe even research, to the next level. So there's there's more to be done in Sri Lanka. Vinod, what do you think? Um, well, I mean, given Sri Lanka is I mean, we're one of one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, one of 36, uh, that takes into account, you know, our terrestrial as well as marine species. Um, I would say over the last, we'll say, since the war, uh, since kind of things picked up with the economic, you know, boom, economic development, you know, the country kind of coming out of this 30-year crisis. Um, and then we've kind of, I feel, come to a point where we are at a crossroads, I would say, like as, as Mudita pointed out, whereas a lot of the, uh, the, the decisions of, we'll say, the last decade and how we're kind of moving forward now is putting a lot of our biodiversity at risk, I would say. Um, you know, you must have heard deforestation is really high, human-elephant conflict is another big one, uh, human-wildlife conflict with leopards in the hill country is now becoming a bigger thing. Uh, now we've gone and we've had this, you know, issue with wildlife being declared as pests like monkeys, that's something that's come up recently in the media. So there are a lot of issues and at the root cause of that issue is, is I think, the, the fact that Sri Lanka is an island like you pointed out with a population of, we'll say, 22 million. Um, so we have finite resources, limited space to expand as well. And then there are 
developmental needs of a country, a growing country, a developing country where we want to obviously, you know, aspire to, to develop. Uh, so that's kind of putting sometimes our, our wildlife populations and our protected areas at risk uh, simply due to, you know, overcrowding and like, a, I guess, a lack of a general overarching plan is how we as a nation want to move forward. Uh, why do you think that those conflicts between wildlife and human is rising at the moment? Well, because we have seen an uptick recently in the recent past. Yeah, uh, it's also I think just because there's again developmental pressure on the landscape. There's only X amount of land available and when we do go into these lands, uh, especially within the terrestrial landscape, when we do go into these lands you're going to see uh, wildlife populations pushed out so you know we'll say if unplanned development happens so I feel like there's a lot of like where's the does Sri Lanka have a huge strategy where you can kind of look what's going on and understand you know okay this is a protected area so around the protected area we're going to do a certain type of work uh, or are we going to put cultivations in so obviously if you were around the protected area if you were to do cultivation then wildlife populations are going to you know come out into those areas because wildlife also don't understand boundaries you know the boundaries that we're putting on them are uh, administrative boundaries um, for them you know we'll say elephants for example they are moving through their home ranges and their landscape for years for generations you know that comes from elephant from elephant group to elephant group herd to herd passed down through generations so they are still roaming around their home ranges and then they'll come into a space and suddenly they'll realize oh there's a banana farm here or something's been moved in because you know people have been moved in with the promise of development and then they don't really know how to interact and live with elephants in that landscape so there obviously will be a crisis um, and, and conflict I mean um, and another thing that I've seen I guess is some of the protected areas in Sri Lanka like w inside them like the national parks aren't, we'll say, managed to the optimal. So there's invasive species are like a huge problem that's kind of affecting our national parks. Uh, so wildlife as well in those areas are pushed out and they unfortunately come into more contact with humans. Yeah, so it is a very complex kind of issue and it's uh, balancing multiple needs. So I think even us as a conservation community need to understand how can we kind of uh, contribute positively and you know also help the nation develop but also kind of protect what's making our country a special place okay so in the marine environment is does Sri Lanka would you agree with uh, we know that as well is it uh, standing at the same level I agree so because I mean uh, when it comes to marine environment so one of the main challenges at least for Sri Lankans is that we are even though we are an island we are so far away from understanding the true value of the ocean and and we get so much of benefits because of the ocean around us i mean we are talking about industries like you know uh, it could be tourism it could be fishing industry uh, our rain comes from the ocean and and also the climate every uh, all uh, uh, the monsoons uh, start from the ocean so these are these are uh, attributes that really Sri Lankans need to understand but unfortunately that's not ha not been the case we, we are seeing unprecedented amounts of like you know uh, unethical illegal fishing practices taking place at the moment uh, in the north we are seeing so much of bottom trawlers in entering our waters and these are uh, mostly South Indian uh, bottom trawlers entering and basically just scraping off the bottom of the sea uh, as we speak uh, you know so uh, the problem has been because of all these geopolitical uh, issues that are that are going on in in the indian ocean uh, sri lanka has very less negotiating power right now and so we haven't been able to really uh, toughen up our regulations and policies to stop these things from happening and we have to understand like the northern province of Sri Lanka has one of the largest uh, seagrass beds and so seagrass is one of the vital components towards sequestering carbon and, and so if there's bottom trawlers just going around scraping the bottom of the sea we are, we are affecting uh, the global environment here and, and so these are things after maybe 20-30 years to look back and see oh we let it happen 
right? You know, it's happening right now. So there is a definite urgency. And, and beyond that, like, you know, we, we are getting reports of how uh, the whale population in, in the south and then even in the east is not to be seen. And one of the uh, contributing uh, uh, reasons uh, these whale watchers and like the local community is saying is that there has been this uh, set of population because of the economic crisis, because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the lack of income for some of these people, they have started using unethical practices of really going right next to the whale and jumping onto the whale. So where they charge like, you know, uh, uh, foreigners, tourists, like large lump sums of money uh, to do something like that. The problem with this is these animals, most of these whales are considered uh, non-migratory and they can be seen in our waters throughout. Globally, there are migratory whales, mostly, and so when something like that takes place, uh, it doesn't have a much larger impact on those whales, but compared to them, it's like literally walking into your home and just barging in without saying, and it stresses these whales, and uh, that has been one of the main reasons why the whale population has decreased. And, and, and so, uh, you can kind of see the correlation like where this economic crisis has really impacted uh, you know the environment and and just because most of these uh, marine environment is not to be seen right it's either to be dived down and seen or like it is there in the large ocean but uh, it's an ecosystem the marine ecosystem is vital and so one keystone species removed, being removed from the environment means the whole ecosystem can fall apart. So we've also seen how much of, um, you know, this pollution that has been going, gushing out. And uh, during the last few years, we've seen some of the bans, plastic bans, and we welcome this uh, ban, especially on the sachet ban. And uh, like, you know, compared to like few years ago, before the sachet ban and now, so much less sachets around, but the problem with sachets is that you can't recycle these things. But now with the economic crisis and like, you know, with people having less income, they are back to using those sorts of uh, methods of just like, you know, daily survival. And so what that means is the pollution is increasing. And if we go down like, you know, uh, the Hivala Beach, we could probably see like even Moruto Beach uh, going up towards like Crow Island and all that. You could see how much of pollution there is at some points you can't even see the sand. So these are all attributes we could possibly link towards like the, the crisis that is taking place and because of, you know, the people's uh, uh, lack of awareness. And, and, and also they have more priorities that they need to kind of figure out on a daily basis than, you know, this love and belonging towards the environment. So I want to say like, it's not looking well, uh, but as, as you know, there has to be more awareness, there has to be more reasoning as to why we really need to conserve the environment, the marine environment especially, and to see how we can take that message forward uh, amongst all people yeah that's right i mean when you talk about the pollution in the beaches right now uh, i think we spoke about we had a small chat uh, before the recording also and i was telling how much i love the beach and it's one of my go-to places but like it's sad to say like even the beach we are in right now i've come here a few years back and this was completely different to what it is now. The problem is uh, people are not aware, as you said, uh, what these actions could result in uh, the ecosystem, you know, what, how it affects the ecosystem. So um, are there any activities or programs which are taking place in order to educate our people right now about the ecosystem and what the repercussions would be of these actions? at the moment? Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of work happening. Uh, I mean, credit to all the conservation groups out there, whether it's marine or terrestrial or, you know, working on the climate change issues. I think everyone's putting out a lot of uh, awareness and education activities, uh, content as well. Uh, there's a lot of material out there available, um, uh, you know, on social media and even in the newspapers and things like that. But what I, I guess there's a disconnect like I guess one of my biggest questions is that the fact that there's a there's a disconnect between understanding um, what your 
rip, your actions, how your actions actually have repercussions. You know, I think a lot of people understand the larger picture, but from my point of view, people are very, you know, absorbed in, you know, their own activities and what's happening in the world. And unfortunately, Sri Lanka has gone through a tough time over the last, we'll say, four years. Um, so because of that, I think environment kind of takes a bit of a backseat. Um, as Mudita pointed out very correctly, like due to the economic crisis, you know, a lot of activities have been, you know, illegal practices are happening because there is a, you know, the pursuit of money. Right, so people are looking at how can they make some income, and unfortunately, the environment is the thing that's suffering, and uh, it isn't at the forefront of people's minds that you know, like even throwing a wrapper away is, is a problem. But then sometimes you also notice that there aren't bins around if you want to throw a wrapper. You know, even if you walk through Colombo, sometimes you know you're looking for a bin, and there isn't a bin. You know, so it's like how do you how do you deal with that? Um, so those are like the little things that I think we need to think about. Uh, so the education is out there, but I think each one of us need to think how can we be an advocate for the earth and how can we be a player, a play a better role in, in protecting the things we love. So like you mentioned, if you love the ocean, you know, what little action can you do to ensure that the ocean stays better? Is that, you know, volunteering with the Pearl Protectors, donating to the WNPS, uh, you know, doing a research internship somewhere. Not everyone needs to work in it, but there are ways that we can all you know, give back. Um, and I think donating and volunteering is a big way because uh, there isn't a lot of, we'll say, all the, all the non-profit organizations here where we're reliant on, you know, grants or, you know, CSR money or things like that in order to function. So there is an opportunity for people to see, you know, if they love something, how can we give back and giving to these organizations who are doing the work on the front line. So that's a way uh, that they can help out. Obviously, volunteering is another one, but I think it starts at home and it starts with yourself. So as cliche as that sounds, if, if we can like do the right thing rather than trying to change other people, like I think it starts with yourself and then you continue that and hopefully other people will listen. Okay, we'll continue this discussion uh, right after a short commercial break. We'll be back soon. You're watching Gen XYZ. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we were in discussion with Mudita and Binod and before we went off uh, into the break I think we had a good idea about the current stance in Sri Lanka and where we stand at the moment compared to the foreign nations as well and I think Binod you left at a very important point when you said that volunteerism plays a role and you know it, it always starts from home so I but I really don't think that our viewers or people out there really get the meaning of volunteerism. They just think of, you know, just going to an event, probably a beach cleanup. I think Mudita can relate to this as well. And then after that, they just stop. Uh, can you tell us like the effect uh, the ecosystem or the country has with your effort and volunteerism taking place? Uh, I would say, I mean, when you think of volunteerism, I think people should broaden their horizon and think it's not only going to a beach cleanup, but sometimes people have soft skills that they have. So it might be, you know, writing, photography, web design, uh, app development is a new thing that's, you know, coming up where we can definitely, I mean, yesterday we had a meeting where we talked about how it, important it would be to have someone who understands coding for the, within the environmental sphere. So I think everyone, if they, like we talked about before, if they do love the environment and if they want to give back, understanding kind of the skills they have and reaching out to the existing current organizations uh, to see how, how can they, you know, uh, make a difference. Uh, even when we started Parrotfish Collective, what we saw was, you know, we had some skills, there was an opportunity, uh, a kind of gap in the market, if you will, for, um, you know, content creation um, so what we did was you know merging artists with writers and you know graphic designers with writers photographers with writers and coming up with a different style of content so I think there's always opportunities um, and understanding your skills and seeing how you can make a difference I think is is very important and there's always room for for growth and uh, also working with collaborating with the existing organizations 
Mudita, if you can add on to that as well, yeah. like, does this volunteerism <coughs> just stop from there? Not at all. So volunteerism, the definition is doing something uh, without expecting anything in return. And, and that core value um, is very important for any human development. So Sri Lanka is right now considered the world's top country when it comes to volunteerism. Uh, that's, uh, well, according to World Giving Index, we have 46% of our uh, population volunteering. So this is a blessing. This is something which Sri Lanka has been gaining throughout its history, the culture, like, you know, how we perceive different activities. We, volunteerism always took uh, precedent and it was very important. Um, but in recent times, volunteerism, the concept of volunteerism has to a certain level died down. It's because uh, a lot of people have not really understood the value of volunteerism and what it can do to kind of self-develop anyone. So, uh, w I mean, the Pearl Protectors is a volunteer platform itself. Uh, and, and, and the core reason uh, why we want to be so is we want to sort of uh, focus any person's uh, passion if they want to, uh, especially for Pearl Protectors, is towards ocean conservation. But what we want to really highlight here is uh, the amount of benefits, especially the youth, can gain because of volunteerism. Uh, at a young age, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, students go to school and then university. We, a lot of them learn a lot of things. Uh, then comes maybe internships and then employment. But something a lot of people miss is volunteering. And so uh, what I believe is volunteerism brings something much valuable compared to anything else. And, and what that is, is like, you know, through volunteerism, you build your capacity. You really identify your capacity, how much you can contribute to the greater, greater good, right? So without expecting anything in return. So we've seen like, you know, the Pearl Protectors has about 2,000 volunteers right now. So all these, all these volunteers are registering or, and coming to volunteer because they are passionate about the ocean and they want to do something towards the ocean. And, and so how we mainstream our sort of volunteer opportunities is that when they come and volunteer, not only are they volunteering, but they are learning a lot from what they do. So the experience, the networking capabilities, the ability to communicate, the ability to take decisions, the leadership roles, these are attributes that we want to uh, include when somebody comes and volunteers. So that has been effective. We've seen volunteers who've been volunteering for longer periods of time, you know, excelling in their life much faster than a person who may have not. So uh, what we want to really emphasize is that, you know, not just, you know, volunteerism, just volunteerism isn't just like, you know, planting a tree or like coming and doing a beach cleanup. It's, it's going beyond it. For example, the, the turtle petrol, which we do annually, where we, during the turtle season, uh, volunteers, a uh, large number of volunteers come to the beach and petrol during the whole night. So from eight or nine in the night till about three or four in the morning, they'll be walking up and down the beach, protecting turtles and their nesting sites. The reason, uh, by doing so, they are learning so much about the, the turtle behavior, the turtle nesting period and like everything about it. At the same time, they will take an experience out of those two months that they may have not got somewhere else. And they are, they are going to use that, especially responsibility, uh, uh, task delegations, uh, leadership roles. There are a lot of things that they can take themselves and apply in their own sphere of like, you know, career or it could be education and it, and it works. And that's the beauty of it. So, uh, uh, we've been always promoting, well, take, take it to the next step. Like, you know, volunteerism should be more of a leadership role, taking responsibility, and Sri Lanka really needs leaders right now. So I think volunteerism is the best way to produce these leaders, genuine leaders, who can really focus on specific uh, topics that are really concerning Sri Lanka.
All right, so now both of you are coming from conservative uh, organizations that conserve the environment. What sort of other support do you all require at the moment? Uh, rather than volunteerism, I believe that you all will definitely need some government support, some fundings as well. Where is Sri Lanka at the moment in regards of funds? Are we in need of it? Uh, so the organization that I represent, the Lanka Environment Fund, we actually started with the idea of um, you know, kind of filling that void, if you will. So we have we work with uh, private individuals, uh, Sri Lankan and non-Sri Lankan who have an interest in the environment, um, as well as in Sri Lanka, uh, who give money in a philanthropic sense, who are supporting us. Uh, so far, we've raised over five hundred and fifty thousand dollars over the last three, four-year period, and we we've, uh, we've been supporting uh, 12, 12 plus projects now over the last few years. Um, so there is, a, there is an opportunity and that is something that we're obviously working towards doing. Um, but Sri Lanka as a country, I think we do need, um, you know, if we can get, uh, unfortunately given the current circumstances in the country, we don't have a lot of money that's been funneled into the environment. Although I, I think both of us feel that that should be, you know, Sri Lanka is you know, blessed with so many resources and if we are to move forward, if we are to push tourism forward like the government's doing, we should be actually understanding what our kind of priorities are and if environment is one of them, we should be pushing money into uh, conserving it and protecting it and uh, kind of nurturing these. Um, so there's obviously an opportunity that way. Um, grants are another way that, you know, funding can come into Sri Lanka. Um, so. There are opportunities, uh, so many global opportunities to apply for. Uh, it's just about finding the right grants and uh, applying for that funding and then also the accountability that kind of comes in with that because um, you don't want money to get lost in the system. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of players, uh, global players working in Sri Lanka. So there isn't, you know, given our biodiversity, like our conserv uh, hotspot status, global hotspot status, you would expect you know, a WWF, Conservation International, some of these bigger players to operate in Sri Lanka, Nature Conservancy, uh, but none of them actually do. So there's an opportunity there for local organizations to really uh, be those people who are doing the work, which, which is what we're seeing in Sri Lanka, which has been fantastic. Um, but in order to support them again, um, you know, funding is required, uh, skills again that people have, how they can give back is obviously necessity. and. Again, like little things like, you know, if you, from a personal standpoint, like if people are going out in the night or, you know, like without getting that one other drink, if they could maybe give that money 2,000 rupees a month towards a conservation organization, that's a lot. So if there's like multiple people doing that, that goes a long way with all these organizations that actually need funding to operate. So I think it's um, thinking of alternative ways as well of how people can give back um, and making ensuring that those kind of modes are open um, for people to donate if they want to. Yeah, another point that you all mentioned was now at the moment Sri Lanka has so many other problems to worry about at the moment with the economic crisis and uh, whatnot. So, and the problem here is the problem of environment or environmental conservation is at the back of their heads at the moment. So how do we make this a priority because as I believe like environment conservation has not been uh, in the first in their list uh, in the past decades or so so it's still there so what can we do further in order to make this a priority um, I believe uh, the love towards the environment uh, by the people of Sri Lanka it's it's been there throughout. I mean, Sri Lanka, let's, I mean, going back in history, uh, before even Buddhism came to Sri Lanka, people in Sri Lanka used to worship the trees and the mountains and the rocks. We were, we were linked with the environment like no other. So we still have that a lot of people um, become emotional. If we see something uh, detrimental taking place uh, to any part of the ecosystem or the environment, uh, but what I, what I see is, like you said, compared to maybe five, ten years ago, that attribute towards really conserving the environment or has kind of gone down. It's because, I mean, if you take, well, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the Maslow's theory, like the Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy. It's a pyramid where you, on the top, you get self-actualization. On the bottom, you get basic needs. In somewhere in the middle, you get love and belonging. 
what has happened is when when our uh, uh, basic income and and the, the comfort of people has gone down that means the love and belonging even reaching the self actualization has reduced and so we are at a stage where uh, we are looking for basic needs. We are, we are trying to, a lot of people are trying to see how we can survive the day. So when it's like that, it's, it's so much difficult to really um, highlight the importance of conserving the environment. Although it's linked with the, the needs and everything, the, the, the future of the country is linked to the conservation of the environment, it's really not uh, the priority for a lot of people. So uh, the way I see we could work around this is, uh, you know, having more dialogues of really, you know, everybody's survival depends on the, on the sustainability and the conservation of the environment. Sri Lanka is an island and, and we have uh, minimum amount of resources. Though we are abundant, we have minimum. And, and so, uh, we, it's it's something that we need to really protect and if we are to really destroy like how we are seeing like you know the marine environment we are seeing a lot of be a lot of these reefs being uh, dynamite uh, sorry some of these reefs being like blast fishing taking place in some of these reefs we are seeing a lot of deforestation for like you know uh, and the mangroves being cut down for like aquaculture and 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 so many problems like that so uh, for example, a case study from Tanzania, right? Uh, this was during 2003 period to 2010 period, right? So this, they, they also had this economic crisis going on during that period. And the enforcement uh, that they had on the marine sphere was much less. And there was uh, so much of blast fishing. Uh, blast fishing is where you literally drop a dynamite to a reef and it just kills off all the fish down there. Usually traditional fishermen don't really do anything uh, like you know to the reefs because they know uh, the reef is where uh, the fish uh, generates and, and they, that's their habitat, right? So nothing is being done. But certain people who want like you know they, who prioritize profit over the conservation, they just do these uh, destructive fishing practices. What it did, did to Tanzania is it destroyed the whole reef system. Uh, they used to have some of the beautiful, most uh, pristine reefs, uh, but all of it was gone. And it was not a temporary removal, it was a permanent removal. Tanzania has lost so much of economic benefits in the long run because of just one action that they couldn't really enforce and regulate. And we are seeing that happening in Sri Lanka. And in the eastern province, we are seeing so much of blast fishing, dynamite fishing happening. And so in the future, whenever we are going to be opening up the east to like, you know, tourists, more tourists to come, there won't be anything to be seen. And it will be a dead sea that we'll be seeing in the future. So like this was just an example. Likewise, we are seeing so many issues that are taking place, popping up in Sri Lanka, which needs uh, more attention and, and, and uh, uh, especially on a policy level, you know, enforcement and regulation needs to be prioritized. We are, uh, we are seeing a lot of, you know, agencies, mandated agencies on authorities not really taking this seriously. And there, the authorities is a, is a body who, who regulates, who enforce these uh, actions. If some, uh, if it's a company or an individual breaking these, they really need to go and like, you know, take action. But that part is not being do done right now. And I was recently talking to uh, a police station, like who, who was, who, who had caught like, you know, a person using a spearfish, a uh, spearfishing gun, which is illegal in Sri Lanka. But the excuse they were saying is, oh, because we have this economic crisis going on and people don't have money, we're just going to allow. That I don't, I, I, that is not an excuse. Uh, by destroying the environment, we are literally destroying the, the future of, of Sri Lanka. So we, we really need to uh, understand this part right now where we really need to conserve, especially now, uh, and, and not just the government, like, you know, uh, um, on corporate level or conservation organization levels, uh, individual level, really be aware of what's going on. And if you see something, speak out and, and uh, really voice out uh, is the best thing that we can do right now. Yeah, even to speak out, Mudita, I think people don't know what's illegal and what's not. 
and um, also as you said it's sad that these things are happening in Sri Lanka and the fact that you know people are not thinking it through and thinking through the long run like we are moving towards you know there's this doomsday which is also coming up you know the clock is closing in as well but well people say that and it's sad to see that you know people don't take this seriously they're just thinking at the current moment and I also do believe that you know people are trying to survive at the moment. So we'll continue this discussion right after this break. We'll uh, you're watching Gen X Y Z, and we'll be back soon. XYZ and uh, we've reached the, our last segment also and in the second segment we were talking about volunteerism and environmental conservation in a uh, holistic perspective. Uh, I want to pose the question now what are the main factors that are contributing to for our har harming the environment per se. Now as you can see like while we are walking also there are items of plastic on the floor like plastic bottles and you know literally plastic bottles on the beach so what are the main factors that are contributing to the harmness of the environment no I, like you said like you know when we're walking down this beach you can see how much of plastic the single-use plastic 90% uh, of it what you're seeing here is single-use plastic and and uh, that has been one of the major issues uh, affecting the, the marine environment, not just in Sri Lanka, but globally. But in Sri Lanka, it's, it's much more significant, uh, mostly also because of the, the amount of waste that is being let out into the ocean. At the same time, we are seeing also transboundary marine litter, which means there are plastic coming in from other countries as well to our coastline. To, uh, to add to that, you can see how there are nurdles that, uh, that you, when you're walking down, these are plastic pellets, uh, microplastic, which, which came to our shorelines after the MV Express Pearl disaster. This was by far the largest uh, maritime disaster, which spilled so much of nurdles to the environment. And you can see how this problem is so difficult to address. Uh, and to really collect these amount of, I mean, we are seeing about 50 to 70 billion amounts of plastic pellets that spilled out to the environment. So we've been doing all these cleanups and still we are seeing so much of nurdles coming up. Similarly, plastic is a, is a major issue. It's, it's because of the behavior of people wanting to just, you know, use certain uh, items for the short term benefit and in return, because Sri Lanka has so much less waste management systems in place, much of this plastic ends up in the ocean. So, uh, like you see, like you know, we, we, we are seeing not just on the beach, we are seeing about 5 to 10 percent of all this plastic ending up in our beaches. But the problem is, underwater, there's so much, of, uh, so much more plastic and waste uh, litter uh, affecting the marine environment. Some of the marine sensitive ecosystems we could find around Sri Lanka. Like I was telling like you know these reef systems provide so much of benefits and what we are seeing when we go diving uh, is that like so much of plastic has gone and got stuck in these reefs and ideally these reefs are places space for marine life to just like you know uh, it, it provides security it, uh, gives them safety and it, it gives them the breeding space but when there's so much of plastic just filled inside these reefs, it has become a dead, dead reef. And that's exactly what we are seeing around the island. And something we could do about this is like, you know, we, we could talk about the government uh, contribution, what the government should be when it comes to policy, uh, not just setting up policy, but setting up policy and following up with enforcement and regulations, proper enforcement and monitoring needs to happen something we are seeing is also like you know some of these plastic items that have been banned are still being used and and similarly uh, there has to be more uh, corporate responsibility 
corporate responsibility should not be greenwashing. Uh, like we're seeing in Sri Lanka, there's a lot of greenwashing taking place. M many of the companies put their logos uh, and, and do advertising more than actually contributing towards, uh, you know, the genuine uh, sustainability or the conservation of the environment. So, especially plastic pollution, we are seeing all these labels put up, all these bins put up, but it has to go beyond it. Uh, we are seeing like bins, bins being put up in the beaches, but without proper waste management, those bins wouldn't get collected. So that is where emphasis needs to go in. Uh, having a better waste management system in place in Sri Lanka. And so if we can actually do this by government and corporates and also individuals, like, you know, really taking behavioral changes to the next level and really uh, seeing how they can go for alternatives rather than depending on single-use plastic. When you go to the supermarket, when you go to the shop, just say no to single-use plastic bags. Next time you go to the restaurant, ask them not to put a straw in. These are simple things that will go far towards really helping the environment and, and also trying to reduce the amount of plastic generated in a household level, right? So these are small things. And if collectively, both government, uh, individuals and corporates and other organizations really contribute, uh, have that willingness, I believe like, you know, one of these major components of how the environment is being affected by, by single-use plastic can be reduced significantly. That's right. And also, we know that I would like to get your idea on this. Also now, Sri Lanka does it have a properly functioning wildlife uh, protecting bill, you know. So how is that playing a role in, you know, y'all having to conserve the environment? Uh, well, I would say what protects our national parks as well as our nature reserves is uh, something called FFPO. It's actually a really good piece of legislation. Uh, it's called the Fauna and Flora Protection Ordinance, um, and it's a very good piece of legislation. I guess the problem is that uh, it's actually not the government doesn't you know doesn't seem to really you know care too much about it, and uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of violations of it happening. I would say that's why. So it's that's kind of the problem. Uh, a lot of the countries, you know, examples that we've talked about before, like countries that we draw on. If you look at the success stories, it's actually um, government agency to actually make change and you know top-down kind of development there's limited things we'll say all these organizations can do if the government really doesn't prioritize something so when it comes to you know protecting our areas it's uh, I guess it's imperative that the government also cares and you know respects some of these piece, pieces of legislation that are in place uh, is it true that we are facing a wildlife depletion at the moment? Yeah, one, I mean 100%, like it would be, uh, I mean we talked about the whales before but on a terrestrial sense, like last year uh, we lost 433 elephants, right? The last census was done in 2011 and that census talked about a number of uh, about 5,800 elephants were recorded in that census. But if you look at the statistics from 2010 to 2020, we've lost about 2,800 elephants, right? So that, that's almost 50% of the elephants listed in that census. So, you know, where are we heading? Without a new census coming up now, the only statistic we have is how many elephants are dying. So we don't really know how many elephants may be out there, uh, but we do know how many are dying. So it's a very worrying statistic um, when it comes to, you know, one of the animals that Sri Lanka is famous for. Uh, and the same goes for, we'll say, you know, leopards, and then like those are the charismatic megafauna, but there are so many other small species that we don't have enough data on. We don't really, uh, we're not doing any studies on, so we don't really know uh, what's actually happening to these animals. And uh, that is something that's super worrisome. Yeah, uh, well, we are reaching the end of our program as well. Before we end, I want both of you all to just advise the audience in like, what more we can do now we spoke about volunteerism but does it end from there what what's the next step that we can take in order to you know protect our environment uh, I mean from my point of view I would say just uh, being more involved like understanding kind of raising your like we like to call it raising your eco literacy uh, kind of understanding you know what what's at stake the beautiful 
wildlife and places Sri Lanka has to offer. Everyone goes and enjoys these places, like you said at the start of the show. You know, people go on holiday there, but it's like understanding your connection to that place and that you also have a part to play in conserving it. I think that's something that's super important, uh, as well as, you know, thinking, thinking about the greater good and also, um, for what it's worth, looking at, you know, when it comes to voting, when it comes to like political will, you know, looking at, looking at politicians who actually care about the country, care about these natural resources and put the country first rather than their own kind of. So I would say having that kind of in the back of your mind and uh, voting for the environment rather than, you know, kind of voting for whoever who doesn't really give a, a care, care about it. I think that's, uh, that's important. Okay, Mudi, if you can add yeah. on to that as well. So adding to that, I mean, those were some really great points that uh, also just adding to it, I, I, I believe uh, something <clears throat> everybody can do is like really understand what they're really passionate about. You know, uh, it could be animals, it could be a general environment, the wildlife, the forests, the ocean, the, it could be a marine uh, animal, it could be a turtle, it could be a whale. Uh, know what you really love, what, know what you're really passionate about and see how you can be a leader to really help that uh, environment or the animal. By doing so, you're, you're inspiring a lot of other people to come on board and really to support you while also taking the message and the conservation message out into the uh, large audience. Learn more about uh, what you re really love. Uh, be in, um, you know, gather information, read news, uh, be updated about what's going on around in the world, what is being uh, used around the world as conservation maybe if you believe like you know something can be done differently in Sri Lanka talk to people talk to uh, talk to others who may know the topic but end of the day if everybody can be leaders in what they really what they're really passionate about I think we could really see a lot more inspiration from the people and and so much of more uh, commitment uh, coming out, uh, you know, on an individual basis, and and that goes beyond the volunteerism. And for to be that, volunteerism and and all the other things that we spoke of today really helps. Behavioral changes, volunteerism, knowledge, all of that can attribute towards this one uh, person. If you can be that uh, role model for the society, that's a massive thing. I think both of you all are setting good examples in being role models as well, you know, starting these initiatives as well. Well, this is all we can talk about the program and thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights on this topic as well, since you all are the experts on this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. For thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank all right. So that was our episode on uh, Gen XYZ. As we spoke about in the program as well, I believe that we can keep on talking about this topic on programs, on social media, but it always comes to the point where we need to take action at this point in order to make anything work. So with that, I would like to end and just in case you couldn't watch us on there, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Stay safe and have a good night. <laughs>